Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy is your name, God. Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's indeed a pleasure and an honor to stand before you tonight to give a word from the Lord. Um, I bring you greetings from the Generation Church of Jesus Christ where Pastor Philip Watson is a pastor there. And I'm just honored to be here. I was honored when he even asked the apostle to do it. And there's an excitement in me when I get to give the word of God. When I get to do what I feel that God has called me to do. And so I, I thank you all tonight for being here. And I know there's a festival going on, as Prophet has said, but a festival of music is what I heard. But the Bible says that make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Yeah. So we can make our own music tonight. And we can worship him and praise him. And our own sound will go out. Amen. Yeah, man. And there's a fair going on too is what I heard also. And But we know when you have rides at the fair. But when you're on the ride with Jesus. You're on the ride of your life. Amen. Amen. So we're going to just bow your heads in a word of prayer tonight as we go into the Lord. Father we thank you Lord for this day Jesus. We give you praise and we give you glory tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to stand before your people tonight, God. God, we ask you, Lord, just to dip me down in your storehouse of your knowledge and your wisdom, Father. Lord, let me decrease and you increase, God. God, give, God, the people what you want to say, God. Speak, Lord, tonight. Yes. For we need to hear from you, God. God, let it be a word of power and instruction, Father, and a word of hope and faith. And we thank you, Lord, and God, we give it all to you. And we say, have your way tonight, God. Have your way, have your way Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 This evening, I um, just want to speak with you briefly about a subject that the Lord gave me. And it's going to be coming from a few scriptures. A few scriptures. The first one uh, we're going to be dealing with is... Ephesians, uh, excuse me, it's not the Ephesians, I'm sorry. 1 Timothy 6 and 12. And that's going to be the main point of our of our scriptures, you know, of our message tonight. 1 Timothy, Timothy 6 and 12. And we're going to be talking about the good fight. All right. The good fight. And 1 Timothy 6 and 12 just reads, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on to eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And the Holy Spirit will have to say tonight that we need to fight the good fight. There are many fights that we can fight, but all of them are not good fights. We find ourselves in fights all the time, and a lot of them don't have to do with what is the fight of faith. And when we look at this, we think about how that we find ourselves when somebody comes to us or something that we hear, we immediately want to do something about it. Because we're human and because we're fleshly, we enter into that. But that is not a good fight. You see, when we talk about a good fight tonight, we talk about how when David, when he was approached with a battle, he would always inquire of the Lord. He would always go to him to see if I need to engage in this fight. Yeah. Because I don't want to do anything without you. I don't want to go anywhere without you. I don't want to go into this battle without you. Because we don't want to do anything without God. Because he is the one that's going to help us win. He's the one going to give us the victory. He's the one that's going to ensure that his name is made great, right. even in the battle. Yeah. So David inquired of the Lord. And when he inquired, God told him to go or he told him to stay. And when he listened to the voice of the Lord, 
he was victorious. But we're talking about fighting the good fight of faith. Paul often referred to things in his scripture from, from a Roman perspective, especially when he dealt with the soldier. He was talking about fighting the good fight of faith. And when I begin to read this, the Holy Spirit would have me just notice what it takes to, to, to actually fight. There's a preparation mode before you begin to fight. When you talk about a boxer, he starts training months before the fight. Right. He starts getting in shape. He starts getting in conditioning. He starts getting that because he needs endurance. He needs strength. He needs mobility. He needs these things. But one of the surefire things he needs is to have a good core. You see, a core helps me with my balance. It helps me also with, uh, when I was reading about it, it helps me strengthen my pelvic muscles it helps me strengthen my, my lower portion so that I can withstand some of the blows. And see, when you talk about having a good core, it enables you to dodge things. Dodge the enemy when he's throwing things at you. Dodge the situations when they're coming at you. It helps you to be able to dodge just a little bit. But a strong core, if you think about it in a spiritual perspective, when we look at Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us that we are to put on this belt. And this belt guards the core of our spiritual being. When we talk about guarding the core, we talk about guarding the very thing that gives us balance and it gives us strength. But when I was reading about this core, it also said that you strengthen the core because what you want to do when you engage into battle, when you begin to fight, there's a transfer of power that comes from your core into your swing, into your hit, into your, your knocking down. The transfer of power comes from your core and enables you to get the knockout blow. So when we look at this in the spiritual sense, we got to have a good core. The core of any believer is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is my core because I can't do anything without the Word. The Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, but the Word was God. If I don't have the core, if I don't have the Word of God, then I don't have God. we got to have the Word tonight, a Word of faith, a Word of hope, a Word of belief. It's the Word. And the good fight of faith often involves the Word of God. It always involves the Word of God. Because I speak the word. And if I don't have any faith back in the word, the word can't work. Because the Bible says in the word of God that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So I cannot have, please God, I cannot have God without my faith. So when we look at this, Paul's talking about this soldier. And he's talking about this, this, this soldier that has a, a, a good core. And he has good balance. And he has good strength and a transfer of power. And when I was reading about that, I thought about it, that, that God wants to, to do the same thing to us. He wants to have a transfer of power. You see, when the disciples came to Jesus, the Bible says he breathed on them the breath of life. He gave them the power that he had. And when God talks about that, he wants to do the same thing with us, a transfer of his power. You see, it's, we, we just can't be saved and live here on earth. He wants us to be empowered with his word, empowered with his strength, empowered with his ability. And so he has a transfer of power through the word of God. It's the core. So we got to have the word in order to get the power. And then, and then the Lord showed me some things tonight. When we get ready to battle, when we get ready to, to, to engage in the battle, as I said before, we often engage in battles that we should not engage in. What are you talking about, preacher? The Bible says in the Word of God that we wrestle against, we, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and, and spiritual wickedness and these things in high places. So when we look at this, the Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And the Lord shows me 
whenever he talks about what we should not do, it's because we do it. We wrestle against flesh and blood. We often go against somebody who's going against us. We often engage in, in battle that we should not engage in. These are the fights that I was saying that we should not be fighting because they're not fights of faith. So we got to engage in the fight of faith. So the Lord gave me a few things to talk about tonight. And these are two, two things that we should not engage in, that we should not be involved in. And one of these is we often fight the process. We, and we fight the process that God is taking us through. We fight the process that he wants to get in us so he can make some changes. We often fight against the process because the process is too painful. The process is too long. The process is too strenuous. The process is not what we want to go through. But yet it's what God wants us to go through. So the first scripture he gave me was Zechariah 13 and 9. If we go to Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9. And I'm going to get there real quickly. We look at what he's talking about. Is the process of what we know as the process of gold and the process of silver. And when I was reading about these processes... Understand that these processes take time. They take time and they take energy. And they take uh, things that we don't normally want to go through. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9. If you have that, you can turn with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Zechariah 13 verse 9. 13 verse 9, and it reads, And I will bring the third part through the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say it is my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. It's the process that God wants to take us through. He wants us to bring us through the fire and bring us through to refine us as silver is refined. Yes. And I was looking at, at, at gold and silver. I was watching videos on how it was actually done and how the gold is actually put in heat and cooling. Heat and cooling is, is designed to take the dross out of the gold. It's designed to take all the impurities out. Right. And the process enables us that God is taking us through has to be with fire. It has to be with fire because the fire is the only thing that makes the pure gold come through. You see, the situations that you're going through, the problems that you're going through, the things that you want to get out of is part of the process. The process that's bringing you through the fire. But the promise of God says that I will take you through the fire and you will not be burned. He said I will take you through the flood and you will not drown. You see, the gold is invaluable. I mean, cement is valuable to, to the person who has the gold. But he said, I will try them as gold because gold is tried by the fire. And when the fire hits the gold at a certain temperature, the draw stops to fall out. The impurities start to fall out. And what you bring forth is pure gold. The silver is a little bit different. It's refined. It's brought through the heat and brought through the cold and brought through the heat, and brought through the cold, and then it's ground into the powder, and then it's put back into the fire again to make liquid. Then it has stuff added to it, and then it comes forth as pure silver. You see, the silver refining is done by a silver smith. It's done by a person that sits there and watches the silver become silver. And when I was looking at this, it said that the silver smith always has his hand on the silver. He puts it in the middle of the fire because the fire is the hottest in the middle. When it's the only the hottest fire can bring forth the pure silver. And so when we look at this, I was looking at the video and it said the silversmith puts it in the fire and he holds it in the fire and he watches it for two things. He watches it for the temperature because the temperature can get so hot it will ruin the silver. So he watches it so he can pull it out just at the right time. But he also puts it in there, and it's in the fire. And the, the lady asked him, said, 
How do you know when the silver is complete? How do you know when the silver is completely done and everything is out of the silver? He said, that's an easy one, ma'am. He said, I can see my reflection in it. I can see my image. I can see my likeness. And I thought that, and in, in, in compared it to us, can he see his reflection in us? Can God see his reflection in what you do? Can he see his reflection in what you say? Can he see his reflection in how you live? Or you like the silver? Because the Bible says that he has his hands on you. That no devil in hell can pull you out of his hands. So if he has you in the fire, it's part of the process that you need to go through to make you into what he needs to make you in. You see, he can't use you to the fullest if you've got a whole bunch of stuff that's not of him in you. But only the fire can take it out of you. Nothing else can take the fire, can take the gold and the silver and make it refined and make it pure except the fire. But we don't want to go through the fire. The fire hurts. The fire burns. The fire is uncomfortable. But yet it's necessary to get whatever it needs to get out of us. But the good thing that we know about God, he will never leave us nor forsake us. No way he fell us. That's what he told Joshua. So he has his hands on us in the fire. And trust God tonight. He'll pull you out if it gets too hot. Yeah. He'll pull you out if it gets too strenuous. He'll pull you out because the silversmith said, if I leave it in there just a fraction of a second too long, I'll lose the whole silver. And I said, I liken that to God. Because he'll pull you out of the fire before it destroys you. He'll pull you out of the heat of the thing before it takes you all the way out. And because it says, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. You see, the whole fire process is to get me closer to God. It's to bring me closer to him, to have a relationship with God. The whole part of the process of the fire is not to destroy me, but to purify me. To get everything else out of it that's not of God so he can see his reflection in us. And so it's the process. So we got to stop fighting the process of God. We need to embrace the process. Embrace what God is doing in our life. Embrace the fire. Because it's not meant to destroy you, but to heal you and bring you out every single time. Don't fight the process. Don't fight the process. And Malachi 3 and 3 even says that he watches you like a silversmith. Yes. He watches you. you even in the midst of the fire, he watches you. As the three Hebrew boys, they were in the fire. And the Holy Spirit, he said that looks like the Son of God walking around with them. He's not going to let you get consumed. He's with you in the fire to show you your purpose. To show you what you're supposed to do. To show you that even the fire cannot burn you. The Bible says that even they, they didn't give a, a, a singe on them. That even they didn't even smell like smoke. The effects of the fire were not on them because of who was walking with them. And that's why I love God. Do not fight the process. Fight the good fight of faith. And the, the next scripture you took me to was 1 Peter 1 and 7. I'm just going to hit that really quickly. 1 Peter 1 and 7. 1 Peter 1 and 7. It says. First Peter 1 and 7. It says that the trial of your faith. Being much more precious than gold. That perish. Though it be tried with fire. Might be found unto praise. And honor and glory. At the appearing of. Of Jesus Christ. Understand that the trial of my faith. I cannot have faith without it being tried. I cannot have faith without it going through something. Because the thing about it is. If I'm going through something. God has to know that I trust him. He has to know that he trusts me. And I need to trust him. Through whatever I'm going through. He said the trial of my faith. Being much more precious than gold. Even though gold is valuable. Your faith is more valuable to God. 
He doesn't need gold. He doesn't need silver. He's the creator of it. But he needs your faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So if, I, if, my, if my faith is being tried, then God is testing this faith in me. I need to understand that I, I can't do this thing without God. I can't have faith without God. He's the one that gives me this God type of faith. I can have faith of everything else. How many of you go every morning to your table and you go sit down and you eat your breakfast? Do you ever think to yourself, this chair is going to fall? Or do you just sit down? How many times do you go to your car? When you go to your car at night, you're not going to think this car might not crank. You're going to crank it right up. Why? Because you have faith. But this type of faith is not the God type of faith. You've been given this faith to know that if I sit down, the chair is not going to fall. Because we were created to have faith in something. We were created to have faith in something. Everybody doesn't believe in God, but they do have faith in something. And that's what God created us. That's why you can go to your chair and sit down. When you came here tonight, you didn't think the chair was going to fall. You thought it was going to hold you up. That's faith. But when God talks about the faith of God, it's saying without faith is impossible to please God. That other translation says without the God type of faith, it's impossible to please him. So I fight this good fight of faith because the enemy is always fighting my faith. Yeah. How do I know he's always fighting my faith? Because he says I fight the good fight of faith. He's my enemy. He's fighting me. He's fighting me not because of I'm, I'm shouting or I'm praying. He's fighting my faith because my faith connects me to God. It connects me to the healer. It connects me to the deliverer. Yeah. It connects me to the Savior. Yeah. It's my faith. How do you know that, preacher? Because the Bible says that we are saved by grace yeah. through faith. faith. Yeah. It's the conduit yeah. in which I'm saved. Faith is yeah. the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the thing that I can't see that makes me more drawn to God. Yeah. I've never seen God, but I believe in him. Not because Tremaine has faith, but because God put faith in me. Right. So the enemy is fighting your faith every single day. Every day. He's fighting you. Why? Because as he told Peter, Jesus told Peter, he said, Satan desires to have you and sift you like wheat. But I have prayed not that your emotions will fail, not that your strength will fail. I have prayed for you that your faith yes. will not fail. Why? Because my faith enables you to do the impossible. Yes. My faith enables you to do the healings and the miracles I've already assigned to your life. Yes. My faith enables that. But I've already prayed. That's good. I've already prayed. Jesus already prayed <laughs> that your faith will not fail. So what does that tell me? It's a promise to me that my faith won't fail because he prayed for me. But you got to receive it unto you. Faith is a gift. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. So I can receive it from Jesus. And I can eat of it all I want to. But faith is also a weapon. Because why do I know that? Because it says I need to fight a good fight of faith. It's a gift of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. But it's also what God gave me to fight. How do I fight with my faith? Well, I fight it through the word of God. Look at this thing right here real quick. The Bible says that whenever I, 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 I hold up my shield of faith in Ephesians, I'm able to block all the fiery That's darts right. of the wicked. That's right. And I begin to research that shield. I begin to understand what Paul was talking about. And I begin to like make me happy because I understood now what Paul was saying. You see, the Roman soldiers had a shield. And when they would go into battle, it was two types of shields that they had. The first one was a parade shield. It was one that they, when they went to the parade and they went to uh, show it off to Caesar, they wore this gold or, or this bronze or this silver shield. And it was for decoration, but it wasn't for battle. And the second shield they had was a shield of that was layered 
and it kept putting layers and layers and layers on top of the, the wood or the, the type of uh, or substance that the shield was made out of. They began to roll the, the skins into the shield. And the, and, the, and, the, and the, excuse me, the article said that when they wove it so tight, it was stronger than steel. And the, and, and the Bible says that the shield of faith blocks all the fiery darts of the wicked. And so I began to look at that. I began to understand this shield made of skins, layer after layer after layer after layer. And I began to understand, if I began to get in my word, and if I begin to read the word, if I begin to absorb the word, I create layers on layers on layers on layers of my shield of faith. And so when the fiery darts come at the shield, it cannot penetrate the word of God. But the shield was interesting when I was reading it because it also said that the soldiers every day would take the oil and they would spread on the shield because it had to be lubricated. And it had to be strengthened. And it had to be where the, the, the skins, when they get dry, and when they face the, the elements of the battle, it began to crack. But the oil protected the shield. And I looked at that and I said, we also need to protect our shield of faith. Because the oil is the Holy Spirit. The oil is the anointing that's on the shield of faith. And if we get into the Word every day, if we get into the presence of God every single day, we anoint our shield with the oil of God. With the oil of God. The oil of God protects my shield of faith. Because the, the fiery darts are coming at me anyway. But if I have the anointing on the shield of faith, the fiery darts cannot penetrate. But one of the, the things that was interesting about this shield also, the last thing, the day of battle, the day of battle, excuse me, the night before the battle, they will saturate the leather and the skins in the water. Because the water would be saturated into the skin of the shield. And so when the fiery darts came at the shield, the water would extinguish the fiery darts. The Bible says that I am washed, or I, I, I have the word of God, and I'm washed by the, the, the washing of the word, the water of the word, excuse me. And so when I get into this word every day before my battle, I begin to wash myself with the water of this word. I begin to wash my shield and saturate it with the word of God. And so when the devil comes with the fiery darts, every single time it hits the water of the word and the dart is extinguished. And the Lord showed me, he said, when these shields, the Roman soldiers, they will all have a shield. And understand this is not a, 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 a small, petty shield. This shield was so big that you could hide behind yeah. the whole shield. Right. You were covered by this shield. Yeah. And if you look at it in, in your life, you're covered by your shield of faith. If you look at it, every time you go into battle, if you get behind the shield of faith, all the fiery darts are coming at you all the time, but you're covered under the shield of faith. Yeah. Because God is protecting you. And so when I look at this also, the article said that the people that were the soldiers would take their, they'd take their shields and engage in battle, but they would take all the shields and bring them together. And when they brought them together, all the shields made one big shield. And so when I look at that, I said, if the people of God yeah. would take their shields and bring them together. How much protection will we be from the enemy? Are you looking out for your brother and your sister? Are you taking your shield of faith and connecting it with them? Yeah. Because if you do that, you create an impenetrable barrier against the fiery darts of the wicked. And you might ask yourself, what are the fiery darts of the wicked? We know that Peter, what Paul was talking about in a, 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 a battle that was physical. Darts were coming in the physical nature of it. It was a real arrow. It was a real shield. It was a real thing. But in the spirit, the fiery darts of the wicked are coming at my mind. The imaginations, yep. the lies, the deceit. All of these are coming at me all day long. 
But if I put up my shield of faith, I block all the fiery darts of the wicked. Because the, the thing that the enemy wants to do, if, if an arrow back then got into a soldier, it will begin to burn in their flesh. It will begin to create a hole, first of all. But it would burn their flesh and create a wound so bad it would kill them. And so when I look at this, the devil is trying to do the same thing in the spiritual sense. He's taking the arrow and he's shooting it at my faith. Because if he finds a place where my faith is lacking, wow. where my faith is weak, he can create a hole in me. He create a hole in my spirit. He create a hole, a hole in my belief. And when I can't believe, I tie my God's hands for doing anything in my life. How do I know that? Because the Bible says when Jesus was at his own country, because they did not believe in him, he said, I could not do many of the miracles. Just a few of them. I could not do a lot of them because of their unbelief. Unbelief stifles the hand of God to move in your life. It stifles it. It's not because God is not able. It's because you tie his hands from doing it in your life with your unbelief. And so when we look at this, the shield of faith blocks these darts. It, it, it blocks the things that he's trying to do to my mind. If Satan controls my mind, he controls me. If he controls my thoughts, he controls me. But what does the word tell me to do? It tells me to cast down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And I bring into captivity everything in the obedience of Christ. So I cast down what's not of God, and I bring in everything that is of God. That's how I make the transfer. And so when we look at this, as we come to a close, I'm looking at this as the good fight of faith. Don't engage in fights that are not good. Don't engage in fights that are not of God. You see, people will try to get on your nerves. They will try to get under your skin. They will try to tell you that, that this and that. And I even mean people that's telling you when you're going through something, Telling you things that are not of God, that are not even of the word. Those are things that you need to cast down. But understand that when I look at this, the Lord will show me. He will show me this right here. And I'm going to close. We've got to start not just being a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. And what do I mean by that? The Bible says to cast all my cares on him because he cares for me. I can't fight every fight. I can't fight every fight that comes to me. So I gotta learn to cast it to him. Because we think that we're bothering God. And I get to and I get to one day, I said, I said, Lord, I'm I'm, I'm saying everything that bothers me to you. I feel like I'm bothering you. And he said, I'm God. He said, I'm God. Thank you, Lord. So I encourage you tonight. Cast all your cares on God. For he cares for you. And learn as the Holy Spirit. I was listening to one of my brothers and he, he showed me this and I've been doing it ever since. When something comes to your mind that's not of the word, whenever your child comes to your mind and you get worried, whenever your situation comes to your mind, I want you to say something. I want you to say, that's not my care. That's not my care. Mm. And I began to say it, and I began to feel bad about it because I said, I'm not caring when I say it's not my care. But the Holy Spirit came to me and he said, you are caring more than you think because you're casting it to me. And by saying that, you're not, that it's not your care, it's saying that you care the most because you're giving it to the one that cares the most. Come on. And you're giving it to the one that can do something about it. And so, out of your mind, say, that's not my care. That's not, not my care. care. That's not my care. When the enemy brings a thought to your mind, say, that's not my care. That's not my care. And you begin to say, I give it to you, God. God, that's your care. Yes. You're not burdening God. You're not hurting God. He's asking you to do this. Why? Because my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Cast all your cares. No matter how small. No matter how big. 
Stop fighting everything. Because the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. So we encourage you tonight. Fight a good fight of faith. If it challenges your faith, you fight it. If it doesn't challenge you in that way, you say, that's not my care. Because God can handle it. His shoulders are big enough to carry the load. His hand is too mighty not to be able to carry it. Cast it all over him. And I dare not close this message without giving God the glory and without bringing him into the equation. Because understand that my faith was finished at the cross. He was the author and the finisher of my faith. Without the cross, I could not have faith in God. Because he's the one that made it sealed by what he did. And I dare not preach the gospel of Christ without including the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because the power resides, my faith resides in what he did for me. The salvation lies in what he did for me. We are saved by grace through faith. It's the faith to believe that he died for me. And he rose for me. And he has all power in his hands. So fight the good fight of faith. And understand that God is not finished with us yet. Because I asked you a question tonight, just I asked, as I asked you before. Can he see his reflection in you? Can he see his image in you? We were made in his image and his likeness. But can he still see himself in you? It's a question that you ask yourself and you ask you and you ask God. It's between you and God. I'm just asking the question tonight. I ask myself the same question. And I said, God, if you cannot see yourself in me, move everything that's not of you out of me. If you've got to take me through the fire, take me through the fire. If you've got to take me through the flood, take me through the flood. If you've got to take me to the wilderness, God, take me to the wilderness. But I want you to see your reflection in me. I was made in your image. I was made in your likeness. And I want to continue in that way. So can he see himself in you? Can God look at you and say, that I can see myself in you. But other than that, can somebody else see God in you? See, you are, as the Bible says, we are the carriers of the gospel. We are the ones that as, as God's love letters to the people of God. But if he's not in us, then we can't carry the message of Christ. So if he's not in you, if people cannot see, and I'm not talking about you going out there broadcasting, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. I'm talking about can they see the way you live as a testimony, I'm a child of God. Can they see the way you talk? Can they see the way you treat people when people aren't even looking? Can they see these things? Can they say that, oh, there's something different about them, that Jesus is inside of them? I can see God all over them. Can they say that? If they can say that, then you know that you've been through the refiner's fire. You've been through the heat of the situation. You've been through the toil of You've been through what is the, the dross that's coming out of you. I understand this is a process that we're going to go through all the way till we leave here. God is constantly taking stuff out of us. He's constantly removing stuff out of us. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that we are his workmanship. Workmanship doesn't end. It's continuous. We don't even know things that are in us. But he's pulling it out of us. Because what we, what we seem to understand sometimes is that we can think that we're done with something. But God, as the Bible says, he don't look at man like man looks at man. He looks at the heart. And the heart contains the seed. And the seed of whatever it is is still in you. And the purging of it gets out the seed. Because he knows that the seed is in you. And the seed will grow into something without you even realizing it. Test yourself sometime. When a person comes at you and you think you're delivered from something, see your reaction when they come to you in that way. See if they touch that nerve. If that thing affects you, then the seed is still there. If the person has hurt you, see if you can go to them in the grocery store. And look at them and have a conversation. Oh, or do you go around and avoid them so you can't even see them? It's a seed that's still there. You might think I'm avoiding conflict 
But what it is, you're allowing that seed to grow. Because you're not allowing the love of Christ to be shed abroad in your heart. You see, understand, if I got a seed in me, then me doing that only waters that seed. It makes it grow into another tree that God has to remove. Understand, there's seeds in me that I have no idea that's in me. So I seek God. And I ask him, Lord, if there's anything in me, you remove it. Because you see what I can't see. And you know what's in me. You created me, God. And I understand that the devil will play on that seed. He will play on that seed every time. He will take it and try to make it grow. But Jesus wants to destroy the seed. The seed of doubt. The seed of unbelief. The seed of bitterness. The seed of hatred. That seed of unforgiveness that may be still in you. Challenge yourself sometime. Look at the person that did you wrong. If you still got a scowl on your face, you know the seed is still there. Ask God to remove it. Ask him to do it. If you were raped or molested as a child, if you can't confront the person, you can't look at them, there's a seed that's still there. Not that they need to say forgive, or ask forgiveness for you. But you need to get that out of you. You can't live in that. Because God wants you to be free from that. If your mom and daddy did you wrong. And you haven't spoken to them in years. There's a seed that's still there. Avoidance is not the way of God. It's not the way. Because we can't love people when we avoid them. We can't do it tonight. So I encourage you tonight. I didn't mean to go that way. I'm following the Holy Spirit tonight. But we fight the good fight of faith. Jesus wants us to love. And he wants us to love unconditionally. How many people hated Jesus? How many people wanted him dead and saw fit that he died? But yet, what did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He knew what they wanted to do. He knew he knows everything. Think about how you would feel if you knew somebody wanted to kill you and you also knew it was going to happen. Could you forgive them? Could you let it go? Could you even want them saved? But Jesus did. And that same love and forgiveness that he had is in you. Why? Because I know that Jesus said that he abides in me and I abide in him. So he can help me forgive. I encourage you tonight. I don't know who I'm talking to, but forgive and live. That's what God wants us to do. You can't live a godly life in unforgiveness. You cannot live a godly life when you see that person and still have these hatred and feelings toward him. My brother said tonight, the emotions. The emotions. The emotions will take me down. Because I can't live in emotions. I got to live in the spirit of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So I encourage you tonight, fight the good fight of faith. God is with you to fight your battles. You're not in it by yourself. He's always with you. Just as when he was with Paul, when he said this, he was with you now. So fight the good fight of faith. Leave the other battles alone. And remember I told you tonight, say it out your mouth, profess it. It's not my care. It's not my care. care. You'll be surprised how that relieves you from things. You'll be surprised how that alleviates things that you want to engage in a battle in and fight yourself. But when you say it's not my care, we can say, oh, we want to. God, I'm casting it to you. I'm giving it to you. But when we speak it out of our mouth, this is not my care, God. This is yours. You give it to him. Because we often have a, a tendency to say, I'm casting it down to you, God. But I go and I pick it back up. And I try to make it mine. And I try to curl it. And I try to nurture it. And I try to make it right. But all I do is cause a burden and a grief on me and my spirit. But when I say that's not my care, I give it to God. I was worried about my children in school with COVID. And I was worried about them because, of course, they had a cluster and 
all these things were happening, but that word came back to me and said, it's not my care. And I wasn't saying, I don't care about you, my children, but I'm caring that God can do what I can't do. Oh, wow. He's in the school. Yeah. He's covering them. I do my part and I say, I cover them by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And then I say, it's not my care, God. It's your care. Because he cares about them even more than I do. He created them. It's his daughter. It's his sons. So I give it to them. And I give it to, she not give it to him so he can do something about it. So I encourage you tonight, fight the good fight of faith. Faith is not denying that the thing doesn't exist. But it's embracing it. And it's saying that, God, you can handle it. That's what my faith is. No matter how big it is, no matter how insurmountable it is, no matter what it is, you can say, I'm not denying that it doesn't exist, God. But I'm saying to you that you can handle it. That's what my faith is. I don't care if it's cancer. I don't care what it is. You say, God, you can handle it. Because there's nothing above your name. There's nothing that supersedes your power. There's nothing that you cannot heal and you cannot deliver. There's no fire that you can't bring me out of, God, because you're God. That's where your faith has to be, the God type of faith, that you see things from a different perspective, that you see things not from your eye, but from God's eye. And when you see things in God's eye, you'll understand his perspective, and you'll understand his grace, and you'll understand his motives for doing things, and you won't be trapped in your own. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Fight the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith. The good fight of faith. Any battle that God puts you in and tells you to go in is a good fight. Fight for your family. Fight for your ministry. Fight, fight, fight the good fight of faith. Fight for your spouse. Fight for the ones that you love. Fight for the ones that aren't saved. That's a good fight. Leave the other petty stuff alone. Leave the trivial stuff alone. Leave the stuff that people come to you to try to get you involved in. That's not of God. Leave it alone. And you say, that's not my care. That's your care, God. That's right, Jesus. That's your care, Jesus. Because you care for me. And giving it to him and saying, God, you know all about it. But God, you care about it more than me. Because it's affecting me, God. It's burdening me, God. It's taking me down, God. And I need you to do something about it. And God is saying to you, tell me. Give it to me. Cast it to me. For I care it. Yes, Nobody loves you more than me. Nobody cares for you more than me. But I got to hear it from your mouth. That's not my care. That's your care, God. He will give you the stuff to care about. He will give you the stuff to fight for. He will give you the stuff to pray for. But everything else that the enemy starts to slide in there, you tell him that's not my care. That's not my care. Bow your heads with me tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the holiness of your word. We thank you for the strength of your word. We thank you for the grace of your word. For you said in your weakness, our weakness, God, your strength is made perfect. And it's through your grace that we have that tonight, God. Father, strengthen everybody in this house tonight, God. You know the weaknesses. You know the strengths. You know the struggles. You know, God, when they lay to you tonight and they cry out to you for God. But help them, God, to cast it to you and tell them it's not my care. God, give them the strength to let it go. Hallelujah. Give them the strength, God, to let it go. God, help them right now, God, to
to absorb the word that you gave tonight, God. Whatever peace was meant for them, God. God, let them, God, take it into the heart, God. And so let see the faith in their heart tonight, God. Help them to fight the good fights, God, that you have us in, Lord. The good fight of faith. And God, help them, as Paul said, not to beat as one that beateth the air, but God, that makes contact, God. In the name of Jesus. Father, help us to fight, God, with the weapons, God, that you've given us, God. Not the carnal ones, God, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty unto God to the pulling down of strongholds. We thank you tonight, God. Help us to fight the good fight of faith. Help us to trust in you the more even tonight, God. Help us to believe, God, that nothing is impossible for you. Help us, God, to get that faith where we need to get it, God. Where you want us to have it, God. So that we see things, God, from your perspective, God. And see things from your way. Give us the vision to see like you, God. In the name of Jesus. Bless every household represented, God. Give them safe passage back home, God. God, help them, God, to understand that there's nothing you're burdening, God, you with, Lord, for you are God. And we thank you tonight, God. We receive your word. We receive your strength. And, God, we receive your peace. Peace in the storm, in the name of Jesus. Peace in the midst of confusion, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. And we give it all to you, God. We surrender it, God, all to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.